Developers, 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 developers. Yes! Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of Burning Platform. This time I have James Governor, co founder of Red Monk. We're going to talk about the changing developer world. You know, everybody, every citizen is becoming a developer, and yet the whole mainframe developers continue to make a decent living. So it's going to be a really interesting session. James, thank you for joining me. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and Red Monk and brag for a couple of minutes? Great. Okay. So, uh, yeah, pleasure to be here. James Governor, uh, co-founder uh, with uh, uh, my colleague Stephen O'Grady of a company called Red Monk. So Red Monk is uh, the industry analyst company that really looks at the world through the lens of the software developer, the practitioner, the engineer, uh, the SRE, the DBA. Um, you know, our, our understanding of the world comes from practitioners. So if we think historically, uh, IT was very much based on purchasing and permission. So top down, uh, a lot more command and control, a lot more permission required. Uh, long cycles of projects, um, long cycles of permissions, and obviously a lot has changed. I'd say the three mega trends over the past sort of 15 um, years or so, and a, a bit longer, but the things that have really coalesced um, to change the way that technology um, adoption happens would be the cloud, open source, and social coding, the availability of all of this knowledge um, uh, that is shared on the internet. Now you bring those three things together, and frankly, the way that, um, uh, the way that IT has done has changed fundamentally. And I'm not saying that um, uh, the, the top-down doesn't matter, that purchasing doesn't matter, but definitely the bottom-up adoption effects that we have helped uh, document um, and frankly advocated for uh, are just much, much more important. So there are lots of other companies out there that, that will understand uh, technology from the top-down. But if you want to understand developers, the choices they're making, why they're making them, we're the folks that do that. And I mean, obviously, when we look at the companies that people aspire to, um, the, those cloud natives, or certainly the, the, you know, the Googles, Netflixes, people talk about the Fang companies, they're engineering led. They're, they're the kind of people that we talk to. They're the kind of people that we understand really well. And I think for us, the interesting question is, how do we get the traditional enterprise to become a bit more effective in software delivery? That's what we do. Great, James. Well, so we've, we're just coming out of the pandemic. Hopefully we're coming out of it. But, you know, I've always been a package application guy, right? I said the Oracle type players. Um, and I saw a big, big, big impact during the pandemic. On-premise applications had all kinds of issues. VPN provisioning, mm -hmm. didn't scale up. And even the cloud application vendors, the Workdays and the Salesforces and so on, ended up looking very horizontal when the big need was vertical telemedicine and healthcare, yep. you know, e-commerce and retail, distance learning and higher education and so on and so forth. So a whole bunch of new boutique players have come up. And then of course we've had the analytics world with C3 and, and Snowflake and all that suddenly become prominent with their IPOs. It almost seems like we're going through a big inflection point in the industry and to your point customers are going to build more or buy more from boutique than they have historically mm -hmm. do you see that similar inflection yeah i mean form? i think i think it's a long-term trend that was probably crystallized in in 2020 i mean i think one of the things that 2020 did it helped make some things visible um it helped make some things clear um and, and so to your, to your point, so if you think about retail, for me, the, the, you know, 2020, think about curbside pickup. Before 2020, that was in retail, it was nice to have. It was something that you could offer to your customers, maybe, but it wasn't absolutely essential. 2020, suddenly you need to be able to offer a service to your customers where they can buy online, uh, they can come and they can pick something up in their car without touching anything, um, ideally without talking to anyone, make the payment there or beforehand, and that, that to me was a really, a really good example because I think retail, the, the, the kinds of organizations that were able to do that, didn't already have it in place, were, were those that had already invested in some reshoring, in some bringing their, their developer talent in-house. I mean, I talk about Target a lot because I think they're, 
the shape of that organization changed pretty fundamentally. Before, before 2020, um, for me, the forcing factor in, in a lot of this is actually Amazon. The companies in retail that could thrive in 2020 were those that had already responded to the digital challenge, the digital threat that Amazon was going to bring to them. But Target had gone from, um, they used to have a 70-30 where they would have 30% um, uh, of, of their, their IT development staff was in-house and 70% um, was external. Um, they had gone through a transformation uh, to have 80% internal and 20% external. And I think we've seen more and more organizations, whether it be in banking, um, retail, more of that in telcos, just this idea that you can't outsource everything. Right. Um, if you're going to be doing, um, if, if you're going to have velocity in your business, uh, you need velocity in uh, your ability to respond to change. You're going to need to have some developers in-house. So uh, I, I would agree. I mean, uh, obviously the packaged apps uh, have had a very good run. They don't go away. Um, but customers are looking for a much higher level of application um, development in order that they can compete um, and or, you know, just respond to the, the body shocks, the hits um, that, that they might be taking. So, yeah, we've seen a lot of that in organizations uh, across the board, really. And yet you talk to C-level executives and they'll say, my God, my IT backlog is so large. I never seem mm -hmm. to get quick enough applications developed or they'll say my god he better my cio better be focused on all the security issues we keep hearing about right so is that why we are seeing a little more towards low code more citizen development is that a way to get a bigger army of developers yeah i mean i think those are those are a couple of things to unpack on the security issue um security should be a concern but if we look at the research um that dr nicole nicole forsgren led um, the DevOps research assessment with Dora, um, she did some really interesting work putting maths on some things that we had suspected. One of the key things is that the elite performers were shipping more code, they were uh, making more changes, but they were shipping more stable code. And uh, security comes along with that, that that sort of, the, the organizations that have invested in modern software delivery uh, have a higher quality and a better understanding of what they're doing. And yeah, the, the, the security and reliability um, don't suffer when you move fast. It's about developing a culture which does its own testing. Um, and it is about enabling you to move fast um, with quality. And, and so I think the security thing, um, it, it should be a concern. And look, there's, there's different kinds of businesses. It's very, very different if you're some startup south of market um, than if you're a highly regulated industry. So yes, security um, continues to be important, uh, but, I, but I do think that, that you know, investing in um, shifting security left, just as we've shifted you know, unit testing and integration testing left is really important. That's why, for example, I've got some friends, I've got a London-based uh, founded startup called Sneak. And what, what they do is this DevSecOps. So making security part of your application delivery lifecycle. And uh, they're crushing it, a huge evaluation, um, winning a lot of customers because of that. So I think security is something that, um, uh, you know, what's the alternative? If we look at, at, at significant breaches we've seen in the last couple of years, one of those was because an organization, a rating agency was running, you know, a 15 year old version of struts. If you're not staying current, if you're not fully understanding the infrastructure that you run on, then you're likely to run into security challenges. What about... No, what about um, oh, sorry, what about, go ahead, Vinny. I was going to say, what about citizen citizen code? Because, you know, yeah. in, certainly in the package world, we're seeing almost a bifurcated market, right? Salesforce has done a great job building its um, trailblazers, low code community. SAP, on the other hand, and Oracle, on the other hand, keep focusing on the more IT-centric um, developer model, right? Yep. So wh where, do you, where do you see? Where do you see the citizen developer? Do they have a role in enterprise apps, or is it more just tweaking? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they do. I think it's a great question. And it's one that, frankly, Redmonk has had to, I mean, look, we, we generally consider ourselves advocates for software developers, professional developers. 
Um, but of course that's changed over the years. Like, what does that mean? Is it someone that has a computer science degree? Not necessarily. There are tons of amazing software developers that came out of, of different backgrounds, uh, maybe boot camps. Um, you know, there's plenty of people that are self-taught. Um, if we think about this, this, this low code phenomenon, the point you made, there is a backlog. Um, um, and, and from Redmonk's perspective, look, we, we've had to say, because yeah, we, we, we've seen waves of this before where, oh, we don't need developers and it'll be code gen or, you know, it, it might be the, the sort of the access world or, you know, you mentioned security. Think about the compliance issues that can arise when everything is an Excel spreadsheet. Um, but, 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 but frankly, the, the, we as a company, we've seen, uh, I, th I think the, the market has spoken. And so low code citizen development is becoming more of a thing. We've got to take it seriously. Now, Salesforce, I think, is, is a particularly interesting case um, because Salesforce, it's, it's really an economic argument. You know, they've got this, this community they call admins. So these are configuration people that understand the business. They're not software developers, but they understand business processes. They want to extend things. Um, they want to support their business users. Now, the, the admin community is amazing. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a middle class group. Um, they're creating economic opportunities for, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. I was going through uh, SFO once and a, a young woman, African-American woman from the TSA uh, she sees my bag. I'm carrying. I'm, I'm. I'm going home from Dreamforce. She says, "Oh, do you work at Salesforce?" Um, and and I said, uh, "I said no, but you know, I, I've just been to the conference there." And she said, "Oh, because you know, I'm doing the 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 trailhead thing. It's my ambition to be an admin. So um, it, it's an on ramp for economic opportunity. You can make, you know, and it's not, you know, oh, I'm a software developer working south of market. I'm making four hundred thousand dollars a year with options or something yeah. like that." It's it's a middle class salary. It's 80, 80, 80 to ninety thousand dollars, which is a good salary, you know, and right. and 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 so um, they've done such a brilliant job of the on ramp, um, opening the funnel with with as you say the 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 trailhead uh, community, and so now they're they're taking all of those people that that come at it from a configuration standpoint and just trying to provide better tools to them. Um, they've done a rebranding recently with Salesforce Lightning. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting to me is the degree to which Salesforce is thinking about economic opportunity for the broadest base of people and building tools that can help enable that. And I think, you know, we need more more of that. Now, I well, haven't certainly, seen... Certainly, they, they've ended up with very passionate customers as a result, right? When Absolutely. Have, yeah. Um, one thing, so let's let's stick stick to citizen developers. It's not a new phenomenon, right? I mean, most of us have written macros in Excel for 30 years, yep. uh, 25 years. Most of us did Lotus Notes databases. The usual issue with citizen code is we end up with proliferation. I was at mm -hmm. Pricewaterhouse when we first rolled out Lotus Notes. Every freaking office had a, rest, uh, a restaurant list and menu list. Every mm -hmm. office. We ended up with so many useless databases, right? So proliferation, um, how do we put guardrails? I mean, with all these citizen development, how do we put guardrails? Is there a, well, is there, is yeah, there a I mean, methodology I, that's emerging around that? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you know, I think we will hit sprawl um, and people will then try and get their, their hands around it. At, at the moment in that area, we, you know, I, I wouldn't say that, that it, it is, and that's the big question, you know, is it architecture? Uh, no, it's it's you know very freewheeling, perhaps a bit more disposable, but perhaps it doesn't matter as much because you know if we think about um, the business problems, if they're changing rapidly, then you are going to build things that that frankly might need to be disposed of. Um, to a point, uh, you know, there, there 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 has been sprawl in the past. That was one of the things that sort of concerned us when we looked at this. You know, I think we'll just see a, a wave of it, frankly, and it, it is what it is. No, I, I don't think we've we've um, we have not seen a coherent set of guardrails that's going to prevent that happening. We're still, I think, in the explosion phase um, in in terms of, of functionality. There's the sort of the you know uh, spreadsheet on steroids, kind of Airtable app sheet view of the world. Um, then you've got that, as I say, sort of Salesforce configuration meets modeling. Um, uh, to uh, build these applications, sorts of approaches. 
Um, so there, there are lots and lots of, 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 of um, possible routes. The one thing I would say is that we, I do think that there is a need for, and one of the things we're seeing is sort of domain-specific tooling. So within those verticals or within, within those application stacks, um, you want tools that are really about um, uh, making them more effective. And I think, you know, that's why Microsoft has been investing heavily in Power Apps. They said to themselves, hang on, we've got the 365 community, um, we've got the Dynamics community, let's build a platform that's specifically, again, for these Power users to make them more productive. I don't think we have the guardrails, but we're certainly um, we're we're building some really interesting tools to uh, create more of those challenges that you're talking about. You know what's been interesting again in the pandemic is you've seen how voice interfaces have taken off, right? That's another extension of coding, right? Alexa is helping us trigger enterprise functions that users couldn't do before. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing, like you say, the whole analytics space is becoming. There's a democracy. I mean, it's amazing what people can do with tools today, analytical tools today. We've seen that in RPA. You know, the whole um, the bot bots that users can write. I mean, integration tools like MuleSoft are allowing ordinary people to connect to enterprise applications. So the whole citizen development is becoming much much broader. It, it's definitely exciting, like you say. It's exploding. I keep going back to the security question, though. Are we op opening up to <laughs> a whole new generation of issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I guess that's the stuff that, that keeps us employed. Um, you know, we build things that are interesting and then they need to be secured or whatever and implement, re-implement, re rinse and repeat. Um, there will be security challenges. But I mean, you know, I think the, the um, I, I think the point you made is very, uh, is very well made. The, 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 the integration is easier than it was, um, and it's in the hands of more people. Um, that will create new challenges, but an organization that has a really effective security posture, really understands what it means to de-perimeterize, is going to reduce those risks. I mean, if we think, you know, there are some companies uh, that, that should be, they should be cloud native, they should know what they're doing. This is not citizen developers. Um, and then they go and they leave an S3 bucket open on Amazon Web Services and stuff leaks. I mean, we just need to get better at this, better at configuration. And interestingly enough, that is often a configuration rather than a development problem. Sure. And we need to be thinking about more secure defaults, more secure configuration and uh, tooling that will enable us to find those buckets or find those applications that are perhaps open in a way that they shouldn't be. So, I mean, again, it, it creates more um, innovation opportunities, but, but you're absolutely right. Security is, is always going to be a challenge, but it's not as if security was working. So, um, you know, we, we, we're going to need some fresh approaches. You know, you made a great point. Uh, a management consultant, I think McKinsey or BCG consultant once told me, he says, Vinny, things go in waves. We decentralize for a while, then we centralize. He says, our business never ends. Every five years, something new comes up. We've seen it before, probably 20 years before, but it keeps coming back. So security cer certainly isn't a new challenge. We're just getting a little more focus on it. Different kind of actors, different threats and so on. But like I say, often it's stupid negligence that causes it. What, what else? I mean, you're sitting on such a exciting, um, energetic set of communities. Mm -hmm. What Are you seeing any parts of the world? Are you seeing any industries that are more exciting to you than others? Well, I mean, you mentioned parts of the, parts of the world. I mean, from my perspective, just one of the most uh, exciting trends that, that we've seen um, is the fact that software development and the industry is becoming a global phenomenon. It's so exciting. Um, you know, uh, we've seen that Remember, there was an old saying they used to have at Sun, uh, innovation happens elsewhere, Sun Microsystems. Uh, it was one, one of the things they were talking about. Um, th that, I think, is now happening at sort of a global scale. And there are incredible developers um, around the world. Um, the, the, the investment is becoming more distributed, too. So um, certainly Europe um, is a much richer uh, investment um, uh, sort of... Um, landscape than it was, you know, if we look at the UK, Germany, France, startups are being funded, there's a lot going on. 
but for me i think the really interesting stuff is is when we when we start looking at some other geos um nigeria right you've got this this huge young population um you know uh, hundreds of millions of people that are really keen to get on now political problems in the geography aside um i track and, and follow a, a, a lot of of actually uh, nigerian software developers um and and increasingly evangelists it's just a really exciting community that's going on there we're seeing we're seeing more investment there um from uh um you know from the the, the us-based companies so they're opening uh development centers uh in nigeria um you know with with last year obviously with coronavirus it was difficult but we were seeing uh, a lot more events there um but also them you know kicking off uh, their own events their own you know their own stamp on this uh just the other day uh, microsoft said they were hiring um uh, developers in nairobi so there's kenya as well um the the i think africa is just this huge and exciting um um market now we've been i think historically we haven't done a great job we haven't been very welcoming really hard for nigerians to get visas to the us and to europe to go to conferences so these amazing people that could come and enrich our work are being refused visas which i think is a bit short-sighted so we need to do a better job of of helping them and also going to where they are so um i think that's interesting but you know around the world there you know as as we've seen if we look at the the indian um uh sort of uh software market which was defined by that sort of outsourcing obviously as as the reshoring has happened outsourcing has had to change but we're seeing startup activity there um yeah, and, and you know, know even in the outsourcing world it's been good to see the secondary and ter tertiary cities in in india start to have talent pools right so you, you, you you're right i mean nigeria is fascinating to hear that by the way nigeria was also kind of the bollywood of africa i mean it's a thriving Nigeria is a, is, is, a, is a creative powerhouse. I mean, it really is. They've got a fantastic art scene. Um, uh, uh, Nigerian hyper-realism. There's a guy called Ayugo Kinsley. Kinsley but there's a, a whole load of... They, they go for this hyper-realist, incredibly detailed, you know, drawing with pen um, or, or, you know, um, uh, sort of... Uh, the, 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 there's, just, there's just so much productivity, but hyper-realism is, is a huge thing there. But yeah, uh, whether it's film... Uh, the arts, uh, software development. There's a lot going on there, and 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 you know that that really excites me. You know, um, China China has an amazing amount of machine learning uh, startups, and so yeah, it, it is. China was. I think they were opening one university every week. <laughs> uh, one technical university every week opens in China, and that's just the the scale of what's going on there is is phenomenal and interesting. But it's really distributed, Vinny. Like I said, I mean, we we we're just well, we were doing some research into JavaScript, um, and you know, look, it's a very brute force um, uh, tool. It's not the most sophisticated, but we were just looking at some Google searches, and it turned out that Armenia is 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 all over JavaScript, right? So Armenia, uh, historically, many great mathematicians, um, landlocked country looking to get ahead software development is a really obvious um um a field uh to to excel and do great work in and yeah we did some research looking at that and there's a lot going on in armenia and you wouldn't necessarily uh have expected that but yeah i mean i think that's what i get excited by um is, is this idea that look i mean so much of that that old joke you know oh we're hiring but you have to relocate to san francisco right. you don't right. have to do that anymore i mean Apple has has engineers in in uh, building backends in in London. Uh, you know so much of the AI work in and around Cambridge. Um, uh, you know the, this the, the investing in in um, African countries, um, and that to me, uh, you know we all need to you know raise these boats. And being it that's there are lots of things about my industry uh, that that I I I might take issue with. Um, but but I do love the idea that we're creating um, uh, economic opportunities um, and or and look we're not creating them people are taking them uh, the tools are there people sure. can 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 make their own opportunities and that's that's fantastic you know on on that I was talking to an executive at Zoho and they have been opening up markets 
customer markets in Nigeria and Dubai. And, and I said, how are you able to do that when most U.S. companies only try to sell to Western English speaking countries? Mm -hmm. He says, well, funnily, we just looked at what traffic was coming through the web. If you see interest in a country, we can go and explore it and see if that is a market. So what a neat way to look at the world differently, right? So like I say, the tools are there. People are using it. We just need to um, take advantage of their interest and develop it. So James, what else? This is fascinating. We could go on for a while. Um, so, so you know, I think that, that for me, uh, that you know, that that so that's the the the, the question of, of geography. I think things that I'm super excited by remote work. You know, we all travel too much. You've been a consultant. I've been a consultant. You know what it's like to burn out, spend too much time on a plane. It doesn't necessarily do your health any good. And I think as an industry, what I would like to see is do you know one of the things I've been talking about. You know, look, I've, I've just described this global phenomenon of countries and people. That, that, that can be involved in software, but let, let's expand that. Like, so going these events, these big events, okay? Um, a lot of them have shown sort of 10X signups. That doesn't mean everybody's as involved as they might've been, but there's a, supposing you're a single parent, um, perhaps you're someone with a disability. Uh, the idea that the events are free and open to everybody has created new, I think, opportunities. And I, I think, uh, you know, we need to, I'd like to see us not go immediately back to just being on planes all the time once we've been vaccinated. I think we should take a step back and actually think about the advantages of, of remote, remote work. One of the things I've been talking about, the last 20 years was about distributed computing. The next 20 years needs to be about distributed work. Like, let's travel when we need to. Um, maybe let's, let, let's travel for pleasure, but don't travel for business so much and just think about um, the, the tools and methods that will enable us to collaborate uh, more effectively. I mean, there are some interesting companies, GitLab, um, they're 100% remote. That's a big part of their story. One of their co-founders, a guy called jo Job van der Oort, um, he created a company called just Remote, and they're just looking at all of the tooling associated with working remotely. And I think it would be good to see us do that, and that excites me. Um, you know, how can we make people productive where they are where they can frankly have a better work-life balance or, um, you know, uh, be, be involved in the communities where they live in a richer way. So I think um, what we haven't seen is tools to properly support that. I mean, Slack and Zoom, if this is the best we can do, then we're really not very imaginative. <laughs> um, but, 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 you know, we will, I, I, I do think, um, you know, we need to rethink how we work and the software, um, uh, the software development, um, you know, software development at scale has been, uh, if we think about Linux or some other examples like that, we, we, we can do this. And I think that software can lead the way to some extent in showing how we can make work more remote. And I'm hopeful that we will see more of that. I think it, it would be good, you know, frankly, the, we, we're on planes too much and that's not good for the climate. Um, James, the only, the only thing I would disagree slightly is in the digital world, we are very enamored with this model, right? There's a lot of the physical work, factories, warehouses, mm -hmm. hospitals, schools that need, we need analog workers, right? And our no job is to make their world far more technologically sophisticated, you know, to make it, I mean, I was talking to a CEO of a warehouse automation company and we were talking about warehouse workers and he was like, well, a lot of turnover, I can see, absenteeism and so on. But he said, you know, it gives me great pride now that a woman who works in a warehouse can go home and tell her daughter that she works with a robot called Chuck every single day, right? A small thing, but you know, he's made her job a little more digital. And it, I think it, we owe it to the rest of the industries to make their jobs much more exciting. Not just think about us. So. That's the only thing. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, you know, that's absolutely right. Um, but but I, I do think that, that sometimes you need to see a pattern before others adopt it. Sure. But look, the bottom but the bottom line is, is, you know, it's, it's you know, Barclays have said, you know, as a bank, they're not going to go back to having as many offices. They just don't see the point in doing it. So, you know, banking, you know, they, they tend to at least keep an eye on the bottom line. 
And they're like, why are we spending all of this money on real estate? We need a new way of working. And to your point about sort of, you know, you don't always need to be super sophisticated. My local bookshop, Pages of Hackney, um, they're amazing. You know, they, they, uh, they, they've just set up a, um, you know, you go and pick it up. You can't enter the shop, but it's uh, Stripe um, for payments. And you just send them an email. I'd like to buy a book. And then, you know, they send you an invoice page. Stripe have everything set up in the back end. So the payment is made. And then, then you get the book. And I think that, you know, that, that sort of the, uh, it's not just massive retailers that have done curbside, any businesses. I mean, uh, nobody asked me is my local, uh, he opened a bar in February last year. <laughs> Can you imagine the timing opening a, a new cocktail bar? Um, and, and then the Rona happened. So he's had to move to e-commerce and, and again, you know, he's had to build up a, a, a website. Um, but yeah, whether we're talking about, look, all of this stuff is hard um, and we should be looking to make frontline workers um, easier and better, uh, not least because as we've seen last year, we're putting them under such severe pressure um, all of the time. So yeah, I mean, yeah, we need to make, uh, we need to make healthcare more equitable. Um, you know, we, the, the people that have been, um, you know, doing all of the work well, I think they don't just deserve better software. They deserve probably a, a salary increase as well, but. Amen, amen um, to that. By the way, you mentioned the word burnout. Not in our business, James. We are in one of the most exciting industries in the world. So no burnout here. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's true. I mean, and that's the thing. We're lucky enough, you and I, that, that we are, you know, we're in control of our own destinies. Burnout happens when you're not. So, you know, I, I think burnout is a problem when you're working, but you're not, um, you're, you're, you're not as self-actualized. You're not in control. You know, we, you and I are extremely privileged, privileged people. Um, but, but, but yeah, I, you know, sometimes it has felt like I'm, 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 you know, I, I'm the, I'm my own boss, I'm in control. But on the other hand, the treadmill we were on of travel, so many conferences, and you, and you think you do, it becomes, um, you don't think about saying no, you, yeah. you're just like, oh, I've got to go to the next one. And, and that there can be, there can be, I'm never going to be burned out, I think, with the industry um, or my work, but the travel treadmill, it's like, wait, right. who's, who, am I really in control here? And that's when I think um, stuff gets more challenging. Yep. I have, I have proof of that. Very little hair left because of all that. <laughs> millions of miles. James, this has been wonderful. Let's do this every few months. Great. I'd be happy to, Vinny. Yeah. Let's, uh, you know, every time you get excited about something new in the development world, let's do another call. Great. Okay. Yeah. Next time, maybe we can talk about, I think one of the things for me that I'm trying to understand, and this is part of my journey, maybe moving up the stack or however you want to articulate it, is, is this move to product focus. You know, we've, we've gone from being a, an industry of projects to an industry of pro products. And what does it mean to do engineering led product management? That's one of the areas that I'm really focusing on. And I think we could have a rich conversation again next time. We can, and we, sh we, sh we can also look at how projects are becoming more automated, right? Systems For integrators sure. during, the, during the pandemic were forced to not travel, to your point. They were forced to do virtual products, projects, mm -hmm. and they've suddenly been forced to automate a lot more. I was screaming at them for 20 years. They wouldn't do it. This has forced them to. So, you know, a lot of topics to talk about. Thank you, James. Thank you, Vinny.